In the early hours of February the 29th of 2024, an elderly man arrived at a hospital in Volusia County, Florida, with numerous injuries to his head, torso, and arms. One of his eyes was swollen shut, and he also had lacerations to his scalp. The unnamed 73-year-old told staff that he'd been hit over the head with a metal object and robbed near the Plantation Pines neighborhood in Daytona Beach. The previous night, he'd met his ex-girlfriend, 34-year-old Chelsea Wright, at a bar to discuss their relationship. The woman suggested they go back to her house and he followed her in his car. At some point during the drive, Wright pulled over and picked up another of her exes, 33-year-old Andrew Marks, before dropping him off near a home. When Wright and her 73-year-old ex-boyfriend reached their destination, the latter got out of his vehicle. Moments later, Marks reappeared and repeatedly struck him in the head with a metal object until he fell to the ground. Marks then stole the older man's wallet and fled. Wright also left the area in the attack's wake, abandoning the victim as he bled on the ground. In the aftermath, detectives conducted surveillance on Wright and eventually arrested her for a traffic infraction, at which point they also found narcotics in her car. Detectives questioned her over the attack on her ex, but Wright identified the culprit as a woman suffering from Alzheimer's, whom she'd picked up from the side of the road. Her version of events was, however, contradicted by messages between her and Marx, in which they planned the robbery together. Marx was arrested in Holly Hill and charged with robbery with a weapon and aggravated battery on a victim over the age of 65, while Wright was charged as principal to the same charges. Number 17. Valerie Rosario After flirting with an attractive 22-year-old New Yorker named Valerie Rosario on Instagram in early 2022, a 24-year-old man agreed to meet with her at an apartment in the Bronx. He was in the residence just long enough to be offered a drink and to let his guard down when three masked gunmen barged into the apartment and pistol whipped him. The man suffered in agony for the next 24 hours as the trio held him captive and tortured him. His attackers doused him with a flammable liquid and set him on fire, beat him, stabbed him, and forced him to face time with a family member in an attempt to obtain a $100,000 ransom. To demonstrate that they were serious about the demand, one of the captors cut the victim with a knife during the video call and threatened to kill him if the family members failed to pay up. Instead of catering to the criminals, however, the man's relatives called the police, who immediately began working to track down the culprits. They located one of the conspirators, Javier Vargas, to a residence in Queens where he was found sitting outside in a van. In the back of the vehicle, officers found the victim unresponsive and barely breathing. With duct tape over his nose and mouth, he was clinging to life and was extremely fortunate that help arrived when it did. Authorities charged Vargas with robbery, kidnapping, assault, and unlawful imprisonment. Rosario and a third suspect, Michael Calendario, were charged with attempted murder, kidnapping, robbery, assault, and unlawful imprisonment. Prosecutors theorized that the suspects targeted the victim because he showed obvious signs of wealth on social media. To avoid the possibility of serving a 25-year sentence, Rosario pleaded guilty to attempted assault and kidnapping in 2023 and was sentenced to eight and a half years in prison followed by five years of probation. Javier Vargas also took a plea deal and received a 10-year prison sentence, while Michael Calendario took his chances on a jury and was found guilty of kidnapping, robbery, and other charges. His sentence is unclear. Number 16. Mandil Mahil In early 2011, a 19-year-old straight-A medical student named Mandil Mahil lured 21-year-old Gangadip Singh to her apartment in Brighton, England. When Singh arrived, he was beaten, thrown into the trunk of his Mercedes-Benz and set on fire by two men. His charred remains were found in his burned-out car, roughly 60 miles from the murder scene in southeast London. Mahil and the victim were once close friends, but their friendship had ended when Singh supposedly tried to assault Mahil while spending the night at her apartment. 
during the summer of 2010. According to prosecutors, Mahil had Singh killed as revenge for the unwanted advances. Following an investigation into the horrific crime, authorities charged Mahil and her two accomplices, Harinder Singh Shoka and Darren Peters, for their alleged roles in Singh's murder. In court, Mahil admitted to luring Singh to her apartment under the false pretense of a fun time and that she lied to the police about it during her initial interview. She acknowledged that Singh would most likely still be alive if he hadn't gone over to her apartment that fateful night, but she denied knowing that her accomplices planned to kill or even physically harm the victim. Mahil was acquitted of murder but found guilty of great bodily harm. She was sentenced to six years in prison and was paroled in 2016 after serving roughly two-thirds of her term behind bars. Harinder Singh Shoka was convicted of murder and sentenced to 22 years to life while Darren Peters received a 12-year prison sentence for manslaughter. Number 15. Vishal Gohel In early 2022, 44-year-old Vishal Gohel's neighbor noticed that the front door to his home in Hertfordshire, England, was ajar. They went inside to check on him and found him bludgeoned to death. With tape over his mouth and blunt force trauma injuries to his head, he had also been choked. Several of Gohel's belongings were missing from the residence, including his cash, iPhone and Apple Watch. On the evening of his murder, he was seen buying soda, cigarettes, alcohol and various other items at a nearby convenience store. He also withdrew around $125 from an ATM and borrowed $125 from his mother. While searching Gohel's phone, investigators discovered that he had recently been in contact with 22-year-old Yali Georgia Bruce Annan. The two had connected through Bruce Annan's Craigslist ad seeking a casual encounter, and Gohel was expecting her to bring two female friends over to his home for some group fun. In accordance with the agreed-upon plan, Bruce Annan showed up at the residence at around 1 o'clock in the morning with 22-year-old Faith Hoppy and 20-year-old Tiana Edwards Hancock. Roughly 90 minutes later, a trio of male intruders later identified as 22-year-old Sakine Gordon, 23-year-old Tevin Leslie, and 22-year-old Brandon Brown barged into the apartment and murdered Gohel. While the men carried out the horrific crime, prosecutors argued that all six suspects were in on the murder and had spent the entire day planning it. Moreover, the female perpetrators were blamed for their failure to help Gohel or to alert anyone to his need for help. Tiana Edwards Hancock was acquitted of all charges. Yali Bruce Annan? Tevin Leslie and Sakine Gordon were convicted of murder and conspiracy to rob while Brandon Brown and Faith Hoppy were found guilty of manslaughter and conspiracy to rob. Those who were convicted in connection with the case received varying sentences ranging from 8 years in prison to life with a minimum of 26 years. Number 14. Talis Bonds and Erin Tillman Recent high school graduate Jack Luebel's future was cruelly cut short in 2019 after he made the regrettable decision to visit a woman he had connected with online at her home in Fraser, Tennessee. As a safety precaution, the 18-year-old sent his cousin a text message stating to send help if he didn't call within a half hour of arriving at the woman's residence. A half hour came and went and Lua Bell's cousin called the police when the young man failed to get in touch. Officers arrived to find Lua Bell dead from a gunshot wound to the head and his car still running. The culprits had made off with his wallet, which contained less than $100 in cash. Using surveillance video, a burner phone number that Lua Bell thought belonged to the young woman he was supposed to meet and other evidence. Investigators traced the crime to a pair of young suspects named Talis Bonds and Erin Tillman. The pair were charged with first-degree murder. According to police, the defendants posed as a woman to lure Lua Bell to the residence, where he was robbed and killed. 
In addition to murdering Luabel, Bonds and Tillman were accused of using a similar scheme to pull off several previous aggravated robberies. Prosecutors argued that the suspects murdered Luabel because he fought back instead of cooperating with their demands. Records show that Bonds and Tillman were convicted of second-degree murder and are both serving a 20-year sentence. Number 13. Damarion Tremel de Great. Three men were shot in Waco, Texas, and one of them lost his life over a several-hour span during the early morning hours in August of 2020. Police were quick to discover that all three victims had made plans to meet with a man they had connected with on the Grinder dating app. 20-year-old Damarian Tremel de Great. After picking de Great up, the first victim drove to a local residence where he believed they were going to buy drugs. He waited in the car while de Great went inside and was sitting in the vehicle when his date exited the home and shot him point-blank in the chest. Despite his injuries, the victim managed to drive to a nearby gas station for help and he fortunately survived the ordeal. Shortly after 2 a.m., the second victim, 23-year-old Jonathan Breedin, crashed his car into a utility pole. He was found suffering from a gunshot wound inside his car and died from his injuries after being rushed to the emergency room. Authorities charged De Great with murder in connection with the fatal shooting and attempted murder for one of two non-fatal shootings that he was suspected of committing throughout the night. He was never charged in the third incident, but remains the prime suspect in that case. Prosecutors accused De Great of being motivated by robbery. He spent three years languishing in county jail while awaiting trial before he decided to take a plea deal. As part of the agreement, De Great pleaded guilty to murder and aggravated assault in exchange for a 40-year prison sentence, with the possibility of parole after 20 years. Number 12. Carla Jacqueline Morales 24-year-old Jose Alfonso Villanueva thought he was going to a dark, remote field in Spring, Texas to celebrate his birthday with a lady friend in July of 2018. He thought that he and Carla Jacqueline Morales would begin their rendezvous by smoking some marijuana together, but he was ambushed by five machete and gun-wielding MS-13 gang members upon arriving at the designated meeting place. Vienna Waver's attackers felt disrespected by him after a recent rap battle and were intent on settling the score. He had been keeping a low profile ever since in an effort to avoid crossing paths with the gang members. And once he realized that he walked into a trap, he made a last ditch effort to flee the scene, but he was unable to escape his assailants who slashed and shot him as he tried to run away, his body was found a week later. Morales and the five MS-13 members were all charged in connection with the deadly attack. The young woman, who was a teenager at the time, told police that she had tried convincing her co-conspirators to spare Villanueva's life, but that the killers told her it was too late for that. As her scheduled trial approached in October 2021, Morales cut off her ankle monitor and fled the area. She managed to evade law enforcement for nine months before she was picked up and taken to jail to await a new trial date. She pleaded guilty to murder in exchange for a 30-year prison sentence in 2023, and her accomplices have also been convicted and sentenced for their roles in the horrific crime. Although the authorities have remained tight-lipped about their sentences, Number 11. John Kosmetatos and Nicole Cross In 2014, 28-year-old John Kosmetatos of Syracuse, New York, persuaded his girlfriend, Nicole Cross, and another woman, Melissa Swift, to pose as escorts in a scheme to lure a victim to an abandoned house and steal their vehicle. They zeroed in on a 40-year-old unsuspecting target named Tony Lewis who went to the property and was beaten and stabbed to death. After killing Lewis, Cosmetatos stole his Cadillac. Later that night, Cosmetatos tried to burn someone's house down. He had been hired to carry out the botched arson, and when it failed, he resorted to robbing the victims instead. Several days after Lewis's body was found, 
Cosmatatos and Cross were arrested in New York City, where the police caught them riding around in the victim's car. The accused killers were extradited to Syracuse, where they each initially faced a murder charge. Cosmatatos offered to plead guilty in exchange for a life sentence if the state would consider dropping or reducing the murder charge against Cross. As a result of the agreement, Cross was convicted of armed robbery and sentenced to 20 years. Melissa Swift also took a plea deal in exchange for her willingness to testify against Cosmatatos. In addition to admitting to Lewis's murder, Cosmatatos pleaded guilty to several other crimes including the robbery and attempted arson he committed after killing Lewis. Additionally, roughly a month before the murder, Cosmatatos had robbed and stabbed a man in the town of Clay. The victim survived and Cosmatatos pleaded guilty to burglary in that case. Two days before that particular robbery, he had stolen a 55-inch TV, an iPhone, a GPS device, wrist watches, liquor, a wallet, and more. He pleaded guilty to a separate burglary charge in that case. The judge imposed a life sentence without the possibility of parole, which is rare in New York State, plus an additional 22 years which will go into effect if Cosmatatos manages to successfully appeal his murder case. He refused to apologize during his sentencing hearing and shamelessly announced that he was proud of his actions. Cosmatatos blamed Lewis for getting himself killed and told the court that he respects the man he sees when he looks in the mirror every day. Number 10. Mutarem Perkikli in 2023, 57-year-old British national Murat Apape turned to the internet to make new friends in Turkey. Prior to his planned move to the country, he connected with a man named Ersan Bashak, who owned a cafe in Istanbul that Apape became a regular at after moving to his new city. During one of his visits to the cafe, he befriended an attractive 19-year-old woman named Mutarem Pekikli. Their connection soon became intimate, but what initially seemed like a budding romance soon took a tragic turn. Early one morning in July of 2023, locals discovered Apape's murdered body hidden in the ventilation shaft of his rented apartment. His remains bore no outward signs of injury or trauma but his wrists had been bound and there was an injection mark on his neck. Additionally, because of the way he had been concealed, police treated his death as suspicious. Security footage from the day of the murder showed Arpape and Pakikli entering the residence together, followed by three men who entered the unit a short while later. During questioning, Pakikli implicated the cafe owner, Ersan Bashak, as the mastermind of the murder plot. She admitted that Bashak had recruited her to help steal Apape's money after he discovered that Apape kept cash inside his apartment. The three men who were seen entering the residence were identified as Serpil Demir, Dojan Sari Yildiz, and Faith Erjinojlu. Pekikli told police that the trio beat Apape unconscious and then killed him with an injection of a deadly substance. Afterwards, Bashak entered the apartment and stole Apape's money. Law enforcement apprehended Pekikli and Demir, who remain in custody. Ergin Ozlu and Sari Yildiz fled to Cyprus, where they continue to evade the law, while Bashak is believed to be in the country of Georgia. The case appears to be ongoing. Number 9. Rohani da Silva Sampaio In February of 2021, wealthy businessman Abel Landim met self-professed digital influencer Roani da Silva Sampaio for intercourse at his luxury apartment in Teresina, Brazil. While 19-year-old Sampaio kept Landim busy in the shower, her boyfriend, Francisco Moises Sousa Batista Jr., broke into the residence. CCTV captured him and two accomplices, kicking down the door with firearms in hand. It would later emerge that Sampaio had been instrumental in planning the raid as she told her boyfriend when the tryst would take place and opened the security gates for him. Batista and his thugs restrained Landin with zip ties and tortured him into revealing the locations of his valuables 
and giving them access to his bank accounts, Landon was beaten mercilessly and he finally surrendered the information following a terrifying game of Russian roulette. Batista, who was reported as being the son of a police official, loaded a revolver with two bullets and pressed it against Landim's head. In addition to draining the victim's account, the gang stole cash, cameras, and other valuables. As they were in the process of ransacking the home, Landim was able to call the police. Officers swiftly descended on the home and Sampaio, Batista, and their accomplices were arrested on the spot. On October the 28th of 2023, Batista was jailed for 20 years. The same sentence was handed to the other thugs, Jean Carlos and Tiago Ruan Martins de Souza. The following day, Sampaio was jailed for 23 years and four months. Number 8. Briona Edi in late 2023, a 35-year-old Florida man connected with 24-year-old Briona Edie on a dating app and agreed to meet with her at an Orlando apartment complex. In accordance with their agreed-upon plan, he picked Edie up late at night and they drove to a nearby park, but the park was closed, so they headed back toward the apartment complex. While driving, the man noticed that Edie was suspiciously active on her phone. When the pair arrived at the property shortly before midnight, there were two suspicious-looking men standing outside, one of whom brandished a gun and ordered the man out of his SUV. The suspects proceeded to rob the victim while Edie allegedly stood nearby, seemingly unfazed by the situation at hand. The thieves demanded the victim's car key ordered him to lie face down on the grass and then sped off with Edie in the stolen vehicle. Police identified Edie as one of the suspects using photos from the dating app that the victim provided and she was booked into custody on a felony armed carjacking charge. While authorities remained tight-lipped on whether or not they had caught the men involved, the case appears to be ongoing. Number 7. Emily Ridout in June of 2024, Las Vegas teenager Connor Reboido met Emily Ridout on Instagram and shortly thereafter, they made plans to meet up and have intimate relations. Ridout was secretly part of a honey trapping plot to rob her date. 19-year-old Reboido worked for a company that refilled ATMs and he often posted boastful photos on social media with large amounts of cash. Also involved in the conspiracy were 23-year-old Skylar Bailey who had the same father as Ridout and her partner, Nathan Nava. In text messages that were later discovered by the authorities, the half-sisters discussed financial difficulties as well as Reboiedo's Instagram page. Bailey and Nava had recently been evicted from their home along with their children. Referring to the victim, Ridout at one point asked her sister, how do you know he even gonna have the money on him? To which the latter replied that Reboiedo always brought cash because he likes to look flashy and show off. Ridout acted as the lure by enticing the team with the promise of intercourse. She and the victim were set to meet on July the 19th in the 4700 block of Arid Avenue near North Nellis Boulevard and East Cheyenne Avenue. On that day, according to a witness report, Reboido was walking with a woman when he was jumped by three men. They all beat the team before one of them brandished a firearm, pistol-whipped Reboido and then fatally shot him. The woman who'd accompanied the victim did nothing to try and defuse the situation. Rebollido was found unresponsive in the parking lot with a gun in his hand and his finger on the trigger. It wasn't clear if he'd tried to return fire. He succumbed to a gunshot wound to the head and a spent cartridge was recovered from the scene. Forensic analysis determined that it wasn't fired by the gun found in his hand. Bailey and Nava were spotted in the area by a detective in an unmarked vehicle, and they were stopped by law enforcement after taking a ride share. The couple were questioned but claimed they were at the apartment complex to meet a friend and denied being involved in the attack on Reboido. They gave officers permission to examine their phones, at which point the honey trap plot was discovered. The authorities' work in theory was that Bailey and Ridout planned the robbery which was then carried out by Nava and whomever else he'd recruited. As of the latest updates on the matter, Bailey, Ridout and Nava were held without bond on charges of open murder, battery with the intent to commit robbery and conspiracy to commit robbery. 
A preliminary hearing for their case was set for September the 17th of 2024. Number 6. Holly Cheeseman In 2019, Englishwoman Holly Cheeseman, aged 32, was jailed for six years after she was found guilty of two counts of robbery and false imprisonment. The charges stemmed from a honey trap scheme that also involved her boyfriend, 41-year-old Jeremy Long. Leading up to June of 2019, Cheeseman had befriended an unnamed 50-year-old man to whom she'd introduced herself as Amy White. They were caught on CCTV as she lured him to her apartment in Hearn Bay, Kent. Cheeseman led him to the bedroom and after they'd gotten undressed, Long burst into the room with a knife threatening to cut off the man's genitals. Long robbed the victim of his bank card and locked him in the apartment as he went to a cash machine. He returned to the home empty-handed, however, because the account was overdrawn. Long then threatened to put the other man in the trunk of his car and drive him somewhere secluded to brutalize him. The victim was forced back to his home at knife point where the couple robbed him of various valuables, including a phone, a TV set, and PS4 gaming console. The thieving duo was arrested in the incident's wake. Long was jailed for six years after he admitted two counts of robbery, false imprisonment, and having a bladed article. Cheeseman denied her charges, claiming that she'd been leading a double life as an escort and that she'd intended to have intercourse with the victim for money. She maintained that he'd willingly offered up his bank card and the other items to Long as an apology for almost having relations with her. A jury, however, found her version of events unconvincing and delivered a guilty verdict. Cheeseman was pregnant at the time of her sentencing and faced the possibility of giving birth while jailed. Even though there was a mother and baby unit at the prison where she was to be detained, her child could legally remain with her only for 18 months. She thus faced the possibility of losing custody. While she was escorted out of the courtroom, Cheeseman told a family member in the public gallery, I've lost the baby, I've lost it. One aspect that had sealed the woman's most recent conviction was her criminal past that featured multiple instances of her targeting vulnerable men. Under the Amy White moniker, she stole the wallet of an 89-year-old man after walking him home in 2005. That same year, she stole another victim's bank card and made numerous fraudulent transactions. Two other past convictions stemmed from her snatching £20 from a vulnerable person and writing a stolen check for £300. Number 5. Emma Giles On December the 21st of 2019, law enforcement was called to an address in the village of West Chiltington, England, after a man in his 40s had been stabbed in the chest. The unnamed victim was attacked in the driveway of his rural home, but managed to go back inside and contact a neighbor who in turn called the emergency services. The victim survived but was left mentally and physically scarred for life. He was the ex-boyfriend of 20-year-old Emma Giles, who'd played a major role in the attack that almost ended his life. The victim had dated her over the summer of 2019, but Emma's father, Mark Giles Sr., didn't approve of the relationship and resorted to threats of violence to pressure him to stop seeing her. The couple eventually broke up and briefly reconnected in December before separating again. Over the days that followed, Emma became the fulcrum in a honey trap murder plot, the planning of which involved Mark Sr., her brother Mark Jr., and her then-boyfriend, Sam Millis. The Giles family and Millis paid a man £3,000 to kill Emma's ex. She agreed to meet the victim outside his home on December the 21st, but never showed up and the hitman was sent instead. He was reportedly identified by the police, but died before he could face justice for the attack. The others were arrested and charged with conspiracy to murder, to which they pleaded not guilty. A jury convicted all four, with Emma receiving a sentence of seven years. Mark Jr. and Millis each jailed for 14 years, and Mark Sr. being handed a 10-year sentence. In an impact statement, the victim said that he doubted he would ever be able to recover from the mental anguish of the attack, saying, I just can't understand why people arrange for this to happen to me. We used to be friends, and I loved one of the people involved. Number 4. Girl 1 After talking on Snapchat, Lyrico Steed and a teenage girl met in a park in Bulwell, Nottinghamshire, England 
on February the 13th of 2019. While they were on their date, the duo was ambushed by a gang of youths. They were caught on CCTV chasing after Steed, who eventually tripped over a low wall and fell to the ground. He was then viciously attacked with bladed weapons and suffered 18 separate stab wounds, six of which were to the face. Steed passed away in a hospital five days later. The police initially had little to go on, but a break in the case came when they were able to identify and track down the female teenager who was with the victim on the night of the attack. She was initially brought in as a witness. Girl 1, as she was identified in official documents, confirmed that she'd met Steed in the park. She claimed that the four thugs who chased after him had also taken her iPad. Girl 1 turned from witness to suspect, following the recovery of CCTV footage from the bus she'd taken home on the night in question. One clip clearly showed her operating the tablet she claimed had been stolen, while another showed her ducking behind seats as police vehicles passed the bus outside. Detectives discovered that Girl 1 had lured Steed to the park where he was ambushed in a honey trap plot concocted by a gang with whom the victim was feuding. Girl 1 was found guilty of manslaughter at Nottingham Crown Court and given a six-year sentence after a jury couldn't agree on whether she knew that she'd be leading Steed to his death. Also convicted of manslaughter were Ramel Miller Campbell and an unnamed male teenager, neither of whom was there when the victim was stabbed. 20-year-old Kashan Campbell and Christian Jameson, aged 18, were convicted of the teen's murder and sentenced to life in prison with minimum terms of 21 and 17 years respectively. The targeted attack stemmed from a feud on the local drill rap scene. Steed was part of a crew that had recorded a video in which they mockingly rapped about Campbell and Jameson's crew, calling them the Athlete Gang, to suggest they ran away from fights. As Steed was dying in the hospital, Campbell released a video in which he rapped, anyone screaming Athlete Gang's gonna get Ramboed up. He was deemed to have dealt the killing blows on Steed with assistance from Jameson, who was identified as his right-hand man. Number 3. Elite and Miranda Barbour 42-year-old Troy LaFerrara of Sunbury, Ohio, was a well-liked member of his community, located roughly 100 miles outside Philadelphia, which is why local residents were shocked when he was found brutally murdered in someone's backyard. In November of 2013, he had been strangled and stabbed to death. Investigators traced La Ferrara's last cell phone call to a young newlywed couple, Elite and Miranda Barbour, who had recently moved to the area from North Carolina and had a history of dabbling in Satanism together. During police questioning, 18-year-old Miranda initially denied knowing La Ferrara or having any knowledge of who he even was. With some prodding, she admitted to stabbing La Ferrara, claiming that he had groped and choked her while they were driving around together. She further stated that after she dumped La Ferrara's body where it was found, she bought cleaning supplies, cleaned up her car, then picked up Elite and took him to a strip club for his birthday. But this version of events didn't match up with the story police received from 22-year-old Elite who told investigators that Miranda was a hired companion, who advertised her services on Craigslist but denied that she was an escort. Not surprisingly, law enforcement found this claim to be highly questionable, and Miranda later admitted that she agreed to perform a certain favor for La Ferrara in exchange for $100. When the police asked Elite about what really happened that night, he admitted that he and Miranda had lured La Ferrara. He confessed to hiding under a blanket in the back seat of the car, while Miranda drove to pick the unsuspecting victim up. Once La Ferrara was in the vehicle, Elite wrapped a cord around his neck from behind while Miranda stabbed him 20 times. Surveillance footage confirmed Elite's claim that he bought the cleaning supplies afterward. After learning that Elite confessed, Miranda stopped claiming that she stabbed La Ferrara in self-defense and owned up to her role in the murder. She even admitted that she and Delight had killed La Ferrara for the sheer thrill of it. During a jailhouse interview with Newsweek in 2014, she claimed that she had killed 22 other victims in at least four states. 
She said she did not regret a single one of the murders and that she only killed people who deserved it, but she has only ever been connected to La Ferrara's murder and authorities do not believe she killed anyone else. Both Miranda and Delight pleaded guilty to second degree murder and are serving life without parole. Today's topic was requested by Gordon, alias me, and Billy Wigginton 3497. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Samantha Joseph By early July of 2008, London teenager Shaquillus Townsend was besotted with Samantha Joseph, who in turn was still pining for ex-boyfriend Danny McLean. Townsend had told his mother that he wanted to marry Joseph, whom he showered with gifts and attention. His love interest was, however, desperate to get back together with McLean. The latter, a member of the Shine My Nine street gang, had broken up with her after he found out that she was also seeing Townsend. 18-year-old McLean asked Joseph to prove her loyalty, telling her, if you still love me, will you set up Shaq? The teen agreed to do so. On July the 3rd, Joseph wore a see-through floral dress when she met Townsend and took a bus with him. He believed they were going to meet her cousin, but in reality, Joseph was leading him to the South London borough of Croydon and the area of Thornton Heath, where McLean and his gang were waiting for him. The bus's surveillance cameras caught Joseph texting someone on her phone. It would later emerge that she secretly kept in touch with McLean as she lured Townsend to an ambush spot. As they reached an alleyway, the team was attacked by McLean and five members of his gang, all of whom were wearing ski masks. Townsend was punched, kicked, struck with a baseball bat and stabbed at least six times. The fatal strike came when McLean plunged a knife into his love rival's chest, raked the blade across his liver and twisted it. The ewes fled when bystanders gathered at the scene. As Townsend lay in a pool of his blood, he was witnessed calling out for his mother and crying, I don't want to die. After the attack, Joseph was caught on CCTV walking away with McLean while carrying his hoodie and a cream-colored handbag stained with blood. Townsend succumbed to his injuries and the honey trap murder would shock the nation, sparking debates on the dangers of gangs and youth violence. The case inspired the 2012 BBC movie My Murder, in which future Star Wars actor John Boyega played Townsend. Joseph was convicted of murder alongside McLean and five members of his gang on September the 3rd of 2009 at the Old Bailey. All were given life sentences with varying minimum terms behind bars with Joseph's set at 10 years and McLean's at 15. These honey trapping cases are getting wilder every year, but what happens when you ask for help from someone you don't know? Find out right after number one because we've lined up our previous release of when asking strangers for help goes wrong. Number 1. Sydney Whitaker In May of 2019, police in North Dallas, Texas responded to a late-night call about a shooting at a local residence. Officers arrived at the scene to find 21-year-old Adrian Wells dead from a gunshot wound. According to authorities, 18-year-old Sydney Whitaker lured Wells outside of his apartment with the promise of performing a specific favor. The moment he opened his door, he was ambushed by three male intruders who forced him back inside. The assailants unexpectedly encountered two of Wells' friends who were watching TV on the second floor of the three-story apartment. They robbed the friends at gunpoint and one of the thieves began shooting. After realizing that there was another person present on the third floor, one of the bullets fatally struck Wells while another victim was critically wounded. A witness told investigators that he thought something seemed off about Whitaker's desire to visit Wells for an intimate act because the two had just met for the first time the day before. He also found it odd that Whitaker had been blowing up Wells' phone shortly before the botched burglary. Two days later, Whitaker reportedly told law enforcement that she had information about the crime. She agreed to come to the police station and speak with detectives, but failed to show up as promised. One of the young woman's relatives said that Whitaker had admitted to visiting Wells' apartment with three men, supposedly to buy marijuana, and that she claimed she had waited in the car while her friends went inside. While sitting in the vehicle, she overheard gunshots. 
A witness told police that they saw Whitaker running away from the property after the gunfire rang out. When the person asked Whitaker if she was okay, she said no and kept running, ignoring his offer to help. Whitaker and two of her alleged co-conspirators, 21-year-old Jeroy Rogers and 22-year-old Tyrone Williams, were charged with capital murder. Records show that Whitaker is serving a 10-year sentence for aggravated robbery and assaulting a public servant. She'll become eligible for parole in 2024, but has a projected release date in 2029. Jeroy Rogers received a 17-year sentence for murder and will become eligible for parole in 2027, while Tyrone Williams does not appear to be in custody, leaving the outcome of his case unclear. On September the 14th of 2013, Jonathan Ferrell was shot several times as he searched for help in the aftermath of a car accident. The 24-year-old had just dropped a friend off at a subdivision in Charlotte, North Carolina, at around 2 a.m. when his vehicle careened into a wooded area near Reedy Creek Road. The severity of the damage forced him to climb out of the car via a rear window. He then dragged himself from the wreck to the first house he could find. When homeowner Sarah McCartney heard banging at her front door at approximately 2.30 a.m., she reportedly thought it was her husband. When she rushed downstairs and opened the door, she saw Ferrell standing outside. McCartney immediately closed the door and called 911 to report an attempted robbery. Three Charlotte Mecklenburg police officers responded to the residence, whereupon Ferrell ran toward them asking for help with his wrecked vehicle. One of the officers, 27-year-old Randall Kerrick, fired a taser at the man but missed. He then fired his semi-automatic service weapon 12 times, striking Ferrell with 10 bullets, killing him instantly. Within a few days, Officer Kerrick was fired and subsequently arraigned on the charge of voluntary manslaughter, but was released on a $45,000 bond. It wasn't clear what had caused Ferrell's vehicular accident. Toxicology test results ruled out the possibility of DUI, as it showed that his blood alcohol level was within the legal limit at the time. In January of 2014, a grand jury initially decided not to indict Kerrick, but the following year, a different grand jury ruled otherwise. A deadlocked jury led to a mistrial. The Attorney General of North Carolina then said that the state wouldn't retry Kerrick. In a separate lawsuit, the city of Charlotte settled with the Ferrell family for $2.25 million. According to the family's lawyer, there was no justification what had transpired that night. He added that Kerrick was a bad cop in an otherwise respectable police department. Number 9. Katrina Danforth 32-year-old Katrina Danforth, a former adult film actress, asked a hitman to kill her ex in exchange for $5,000. In October of 2018, when Danforth met with the contract killer, she told him that the body had to be found and that she didn't care about collateral damage as long as her own child wasn't harmed. After their meeting, the Idaho woman sent a down payment of $2,500 contained in a thank you card to the hitman's home in Montana. In December, she was taken into custody by federal agents at Spokane International Airport in Washington with the help of the hitman, who was in fact an undercover police officer. Following her guilty plea to charges of seeking a contract killing, she was ordered to pay $1,000 and sentenced to a decade of incarceration, followed by three years of probation. Number 8. India Chip Chase Hours after having several cocktails at a club in England, a 20-year-old woman was assaulted and strangled to death in January of 2016. The harrowing incident, which took place in Northampton, started when India Chip Chase and her friends went to NB's Cocktail Bar and Club on Bridge Street at around 11.30 p.m. on January the 29th. After drinking six Jaeger bomb cocktails, Chip Chase was later seen slumped over and dropped her handbag on the floor at approximately 12.30 a.m. She then exited the club by herself and told the doorman outside she wanted to go home. She was placed in a taxi but then got out of the vehicle after an apparent dispute with the driver over money. Surveillance footage showed Chip Chase stumbling about on the sidewalk and sitting on the pavement crying as she talked on the phone. A man standing in the queue to get into the club subsequently approached her. According to witnesses, the man told her not to worry because he'd get her home safe. In CCTV footage, the two appeared to have a heated conversation before the man helped her get in a taxi and followed her in shortly before 1.30 a.m. 
Fifteen hours later, Chip Chase, who was employed as a barmaid, failed to show up for work and was reported missing by her parents. On the afternoon of January the 31st, the woman's lifeless body was found on a mattress at Edward Tenniswood's home on Stanley Road, but the man wasn't there. Police recognized the 52-year-old as the individual seen approaching Chip Chase in the CCTV images. They were reportedly able to trace the victim's mobile signal to his residence. Tenniswood was later located at the Ibis Hotel in Mere Fear, where he was arrested on suspicion of murder. During his resulting trial, he claimed that he and Chip Chase had shared a loving and organic intimacy during the course of which he was instructed to put his hands around her neck, not realizing she was suffocating. Several pieces of inculpatory evidence, including Tennis Wood's DNA under the woman's fingernails, were presented in court. The jury unanimously found him guilty of murder and assault after a 10-day trial. In August of 2016, Tennis Wood was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 30 years and an additional 12 years to be served concurrently. Number 7. Benjamin Kyle Barber a Florida man convicted of falsifying his identity and trafficking stolen property was arrested in Okeechobee after soliciting a stranger's assistance to dispose of a gun on June the 9th of 2020. A woman at a Circle K convenience store and gas station was approached by 30-year-old Benjamin Kyle Barber from Ocala who said he had something for her. Barber reportedly resided behind the convenience store in the woods and asked the woman to accompany him there shortly after 12.30 a.m. According to the Marion County Sheriff's Office, after the two went into the woods, Barber produced a black handgun from his right pocket and pointed it at the woman's face, asking if she'd help him get rid of it. Afraid of getting shot, she ran back to the store. The suspect subsequently followed and told her that he'd drag her back to the woods to kill her if she didn't help him. She ultimately escaped and reported the incident to law enforcement. A deputy was subsequently dispatched to the scene. The officer found Barber, who identified himself as a convict and confirmed that he was at the store with the weapon. He claimed the weapon in his possession was a black BB gun he carried for protection. He denied ever threatening anyone claiming he'd only asked the woman to assist him with disposing of the gun. The weapon was later recovered by the deputy. After the man's criminal record was confirmed, he was arrested and booked into the Marion County Jail on charges of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon and possession of a weapon by a convicted felon. He was held on a $5,000 bond. Number 6. Joshua Cooper Near the end of autumn in 2022, a Pennsylvania teen was charged as an adult after he allegedly killed a young girl, then sought assistance in covering up the crime. The gruesome incident, which took place in the residential suburb of Bensalem, unfolded after 16-year-old Joshua Cooper called an acquaintance via Instagram on November the 25th of 2022, saying he'd just killed someone. According to a statement from local police, Cooper showed the feet and legs of someone covered in blood during the video call. Subsequently, he asked for help with disposing of the body. Law enforcement were notified by the mother of Cooper's acquaintance who reported her son's harrowing conversation with the teen at approximately 4 p.m. Upon arriving at the suspect's mobile home at 1446 Gibson Road, officers discovered a young girl who'd succumbed to a gunshot wound on the floor of the bathroom. Police said that there were towels, bottles of bleach and other household cleaners on the premises. The suspect was later found and apprehended in the area of Newport Mews Drive and Groton Drive. While he was being taken into custody, he reportedly said he was sorry and that the killing was an accident. Cooper was charged with criminal homicide, possessing instruments of crime and tampering with physical evidence. He was denied bail and sent to the Edison Juvenile Detention Center. According to an arrest affidavit, he told detectives that on the day of the shooting, he'd been arranging his father's guns. The victim, who was described as Cooper's best friend, had been dropped off at the mobile home by her family. The two friends reportedly watched Netflix prior to the murder. In March of 2023, Cooper entered a plea of not guilty. When confronted with the details of the killing, he reportedly broke down. As of the latest developments, he had yet to be formally arraigned. Number 5. Kate Mott A woman from Southport, Merseyside, England, initially sought help from the police in connection with her contentious divorce before being found dead. In January of 2010, three months prior to her death, 35-year-old Kate Mott 
had been in the middle of a divorce when she obtained a non-molestation order against her 32-year-old husband, Brent. At various times, she filed complaints against the man, which the police repeatedly neglected to deal with. According to the Independent Police Complaints Commission, authorities failed to comprehend the seriousness of the injunction Kate had obtained and considered her complaint as adults fighting over divorce proceedings. An officer advised the woman to contact her solicitor rather than the police. Ultimately, Brent would force himself on her and strangle her to death at their home in Everard Road before driving her lifeless body to a field in Scarisbrick. He reportedly attempted to make the crime scene look like a car accident. Kate was discovered inside the couple's Ford Focus on January the 21st of 2010. Seven months later, Brent was convicted of her murder. He was sentenced to a minimum of 25 years behind bars for the crime. The Daily Mail reported in January of 2012 that the Merseyside Police Force had apologized to the victim's family and made a number of policy changes to improve their service. Number 4. Natalie Schotter the Metropolitan Police of Greater London were accused of deplorable, inhumane behavior after ignoring a citizen's plea for help. On July the 17th of 2021, 37-year-old Natalie Shutter was found dead in South Hall Park, West London, after having been assaulted. Her mother, Cass Shutter Wheatman, said her daughter had been having a night out on the town and had been in the park with a friend. The latter reportedly approached two police officers nearby and asked for their help because Natalie was unwell. The officers apparently refused to assist and told the friend to call 101. The victim's mother said that if they'd aided Natalie, she wouldn't have died that night. Post-mortem tests found her cause of death to be inconclusive. Cass accused law enforcement of failing to protect vulnerable people. An internal investigation was launched, but it was ultimately decided that the officers wouldn't face misconduct proceedings. Cass wrote to the Met Commissioner saying that the family was appalled and absolutely insulted by their decision. A spokesperson for the Independent Office for Police Conduct said that they'd received the complaint and decided that a local investigation by the force was appropriate. It was unclear if the investigation had concluded or if Natalie's case had been solved. Number 3. Deanna Marie Stinson In April of 2022, 51-year-old Deanna Marie Stinson was sentenced to prison time after attempting to hire a hitman to murder her ex-boyfriend's wife. In the summer of the previous year, the Tampa woman searched for an assassin on the dark web, posting that she needed a Florida job done. In July, she included the target's name, address, and photo and made five Bitcoin transactions for a total of $12,307.61. The FBI was alerted and an undercover agent contacted Stinson the following month, posing as a hitman. She was arrested in September and pleaded guilty in January of 2022. On April the 20th of 2022, she was sentenced to 78 months behind bars, to be followed by three years of supervised release. Stinson was also fined more than $12,000. Number 2. Cheryl Thibodeau in September of 2021, a professional killer's services were sought by a Texas woman who wanted a member of her family dead. According to the Rusk County Sheriff, an undercover officer made contact with 42-year-old Cheryl Thibodeau of Henderson before she could find an actual hitman. On October the 4th, the woman was apprehended after law enforcement reportedly had enough probable cause to warrant her arrest. It was unclear what Thibodeau's motive for the contract killing was. She was charged with criminal solicitation for capital murder and booked into the county jail on a $100,000 bond. She faced the possibility of spending up to 99 years in prison for the crime. Number 1. Georgia Hotel Guest An inebriated hotel guest who was visiting a friend in Georgia requested help from the front desk attendant after getting locked out of her room on December the 3rd of 2022. The woman, who was described as highly intoxicated, realized she was locked out after her friend had already left the hotel. As she was on her way down to the lobby to ask for assistance, she urinated on herself in the elevator. Upon arriving at the front desk, she told the employee what had transpired and asked for help. Shortly before 2.10 a.m., the attendant told her to follow him to the office so she could clean up first. In footage captured by the hotel security cameras, the two were seen leaving the frame before coming back 20 minutes later. According to a report by WSB-TV, the woman was only wearing a shirt 
and her underwear as she was sitting in a chair and putting her pants back on. She then followed the man out of the hotel and across the parking lot. The employee didn't come back, while the woman returned to the lobby and called 911. She was then taken to a hospital to be examined. Another hotel staff member identified the front desk attendant as 31-year-old Jermaine Oswald Sue Tim to the police. Two days later, Sue Tim was taken into custody and booked at the Coweta County Jail on charges of assault and kidnapping. Thanks for watching. Would you rather get stung by 100 bees or be romantically involved with your best friend's mum or dad? Let us know in the comments section below.